Hello, Psych 299 statistics students. This is Larry Hatcher. Uh, in, we're in analysis of variance with one between subjects factor. We have proceeded to module 132.40, Omnibus F Test. Uh, this lecture is long enough that I'm going to divide uh, the lecture into two videos. This is video part one where we get started. Uh, and then I'll tell you when we come to the point that you need to open up video part two for the second half of the lecture. Analysis variance, you've heard me say, is a super important statistical procedure. That's why we have to spend moderate amount of time uh, talking about it. Uh, as you watch this presentation, you should be following along with my lecture notes. I assume that you are. If you don't have my lecture notes in front of you, you can find them by going to Canvas, Psych 299. Uh, on the left side of the Canvas interface, select Modules, then open up the module called Mod 132.40 on the F-Test. Go to the section called Blank Lecture Notes. You'll find two documents there. It's a Word document and a PDF. Uh, they contain exactly the same files. You can follow along with my lecture and fill in the blanks as I fill in the blanks in this lecture. Ultimately, this is all going to result in a 10-point Canvas quiz. Uh, details will be at the end of part two of this video. Analysis of variance, one way with one between subjects factor. The objectives for this module, by the end of it, you'll be able to state the omnibus null hypothesis that's tested by the F statistic with one way analysis of variance. You'll be able to compute degrees freedom and mean squares. You'll be able to compute the obtained F statistic and locate the critical value of F in a table of F. You'll be able to make the right decision regarding rejecting or failing to reject the null hypothesis. You'll be able to prepare a table that summarizes the results from the analysis. Illustrative, uh, illustrative investigation. This should sound familiar to you. This is the same illustrative investigation that I've used to illustrate other parts of one-way analysis of variance. Uh, imagine you're conducting an investigation in the general area of health psychology. You have a sample of 21 college students that ultimately are going to be assigned to three different treatment conditions. Uh, you're going to manipulate an independent variable, and your independent variable is financial incentives. Your question, will this financial incentives independent variable have an effect on the dependent variable in your study, which is the minutes of aerobic exercise that they engage in in a typical week? There's any number of ways your study might turn out. Here's a graph that illustrates one possible set of results. Maybe at the end of the analysis, you will find that the people that are in the high incentive condition, represented by this mean and its error bars, maybe they will score significantly higher than the two other treatment conditions with respect to their mean scores on exercise minutes. Uh, this figure may illustrate the independent variable as three points on the x-axis, low incentive people, medium incentive people, high incentive condi uh, people. Uh, the dependent variables represented by these scores on the y-axis. Here we have an outcome where the high incentive people scored significantly higher than the other two groups. Maybe this is what you'll get by the end of your investigation. You heard me say in a previous lecture that when we do one-way ANOVA. There are actually two different kinds of significance tests that are performed. Uh, there's an omnibus significance test. Omnibus significance test allows you to determine whether you have an overall statistically significant effect. Second kind of effect that you can investigate are focus comparison significance tests, which tells you whether there's a significant difference between two specific treatment condition means. Uh, this lecture deals only with the omnibus significance test. Uh, typically the first thing that a reader of research article will look for, uh, did you get an overall effect? They'll look for your F statistic to determine that and this lecture is going to be all about computing the F statistic, determining whether you have a statistically significant omnibus effect. The omnibus research hypothesis that we're investigating in this analysis goes something like this. 
Financial incentives have an effect on exercise minutes displayed by college students. If you're the researcher, you probably hope that you'll get support for this research hypothesis by the end of this analysis and the other analyses you'll be doing. This F-test that we're going to test in this video involves testing an omnibus statistical null hypothesis. An omnibus statistical null hypothesis is a prediction of zero overall relationship between the independent variable and dependent variable. In other words, it's a prediction that there's no differences between any of the conditions that are being compared. Uh, we use H with a zero subscript as our symbol for the omnibus statistical null hypothesis. General form for stating an omnibus statistical null hypothesis looks like this. Uh, null hypothesis is that mu sub 1 is equal to mu sub 2 is equal to dot 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 mu sub k, where k represents the number of conditions in your investigation. Uh, in general, the omnibus statistical null hypothesis makes a statement along the lines of in the population there's no difference between any of the conditions with respect to mean scores on the dependent variable. For our current investigation we're going to get specific and talk about the actual treatment conditions that we have in our study. For our investigation the null hypothesis says mu for the low incentive condition is equal to mu for the medium incentive condition is equal to mu for the high incentive conditions to put it in verbal terms in the population there's no difference between participants in the low incentive condition the medium incentive condition or the high incentive condition with respect to their mean scores on the dependent variable exercise minutes as is usually the case you hope to reject this null hypothesis. If you're the researcher, you almost always want to get statistically significant results, and that requires you have to be able to reject this null hypothesis by the end of the analysis. We test this omnibus null hypothesis by computing an obtained F statistic, represented by uh, uppercase letter F with an OBT subscript. We compute the obtained F statistic through division, take the mean square between groups represented as MSBN, whatever that is, divide by the mean square within groups, uh, MSWN. I've kind of set up these concepts of mean square between groups and mean square within groups in previous lectures in this series. You'll remember me saying that in computing this F statistic, we think of the mean square between as representing signal. Um, mean square between reflects signal, the effect of the independent variable. In most cases, you hope that your independent variable is going to have a big effect, so you have a big signal. In most cases, we think of the mean square within as representing noise. Mean square within reflects just noise, just error variance. Uh, that's the fact that there's some variability in scores on the dependent variable, and we don't know what to attribute that variability to. It's represented as the mean square within. In typical investigation, you hope you get a big signal to noise ratio. If you get a big signal to noise ratio, more likely to get statistically significant results. You'll get statistically significant results if the between groups variability is relatively big and the within groups variability is relatively weensy. You remember in my last lecture, the last video, I gave you this mnemonic device. These are the circumstances under which you'll likely get a significant omnibus F statistic. Uh, the between groups variance should be big. The within groups variance should be wincy. B is the first letter in B between and big. W is the first letter in within and win wincy. That's my memory device that I hope will help you to remember. Uh, these are the ideal kind of outcomes that you want to get. Uh, the kind of outcomes that will make it more likely you'll get statistically significant results. With each of the statistics we cover this semester, you've heard me say it's important that you're familiar with the no effect value for this statistic. No effect value for the F statistic is 1.0. If you do an analysis and your obtained F statistic is close to 1.0, you'll conclude null hypothesis is probably true. On the other hand, 
If your obtained if statistic is substantially larger than 1.0, then you'll reject the null hypothesis. And yes, later on we'll talk about just how big does your obtained if statistic have to be. The ANOVA summary table. Computing an obtained if statistic involves a lot of statistics. It can get confusing if you're just reading that in kind of a linear fashion going through the chapter of a textbook. Most students and researchers find it easier to comprehend and think about this information if we instead organize all of these statistics into an ANOVA summary table. Here's an example of an ANOVA summary table with symbols. Normally when you see an ANOVA summary table in a published journal article, it won't have symbols in it, it'll have numbers, but I'm going to begin with the symbols. ANOVA summary table, uh, think of it as consisting of three rows. That is, we're talking about one-way analysis variance with one between subjects factor. It consists of three rows. The first row is headed between groups. We'll talk about what that means. Second row is headed within groups. We'll talk about what that means. Last row is headed total. We'll talk about what that means. There are five different kinds of values that can appear in the table. First column is headed SS for sums of squares. We'll talk about that soon. Second one is headed DF for degrees of freedom. Third is headed MS for mean square. Then the last two columns are the ones that the reader of the research article typically care about the most. Uh, one is headed F, that's where you'll put your obtained F statistic. And one is headed lowercase p, that's where you'll put your obtained p value, your obtained probability value. Here's the same ANOVA summary table. This time I filled it in with statistics. Uh, these are real statistics from a real analysis. It's a fictitious study and I just made up the data. Uh, but all of these numbers are correct, copied over from statistical application output. Uh, what does our title say? ANOVA summary table, exercise minutes as a function of financial incentives, statistically non-significant results. Uh, this is fictitious data that I cooked up to give us non-significant results. The first uh, outcome that I'm going to go over in this lecture will show you what non-significant results look like. And then later I'll show you a second outcome in which the results are statistically significant. Notice instead of symbols within the body of the table, I now have numbers. And yes, we will go through all these numbers and what they mean in the course of my lecture. Out of all the numbers that I'm about to go over, and as I said, this is going to be kind of a long lecture. Out of all the numbers that I go over, at this point, the only thing that we really care about much, the only thing the reader of the article cares about much is the obtained F statistic. That's going to be the value that's under the heading F. In this case, with these fictitious data, you can see we have an obtained F statistic of 1.80. A little bit later, we'll talk about whether that's a good number to get or a bad number to get. I've circled it in red here so it stands out. The way we compute an obtained F statistic is by dividing the, see this heading, MS, MS means mean square, to the right of the heading between groups. What we're looking at here is the mean square between groups. The way that we compute the F statistic, which was in this location, is by taking the mean square between groups, Divide it by the mean square within groups. If you take this 350 and something, divide it by 194 and something, you get our F statistic 1.80. We'll go through that step by step before long. Note, skip to slide 40 if short on time, but I still need to fill in the blanks and students must still study the following slides for the test. This is just a note to myself in future semesters when we're actually meeting face to face. If I'm short on time, I do speed round with the next few slides. But since you folks are watching a video on your own time, uh, we can continue and I'll just go ahead and deliver uh, the lecture of the next few slides. Um, this topic, why is it called analysis of variance? This is an important issue to me. A lot of times we uh, kind of slug our way through a statistics class and we come across terms that don't really understand why they call things the, the, the way they do. I think if you understand what we call this statistical procedure analysis of variance, a lot of the pieces are going to fall into place better. 
Um, we call this procedure analysis variance because we begin with the total variance of scores on a dependent variable and we divide that total variance into its two components. We divide it into between groups variance versus within groups variance. Uh, in the analysis, if the between groups variance is larger than the within groups variance, we'll reject the null hypothesis. I set up these concepts in a previous lecture. In this lecture, I'm going to we're going to go back and revisit them, and I'm going to apply some numbers to those concepts. In the um, ANOVA summary table that I showed you before, I indicated that there were three rows in the body of the table. Uh, and those three rows provide information about our three sources of variation. Notice the heading here, source, that's uh, short for source of variation. Below it, we have between groups, within groups, total. We'll actually begin with the bottom row. The third row in this table is headed total. It is in this row that we have information about total variability in the data set that's being analyzed in the analysis of variance. As total variability is represented by the sum of the squares total. In this case, the value is 4,200. The number is not going to be terribly meaningful because when you look at statistics in the sum of squares column, they are non, they're not standardized in any way. So these numbers can be astronomically large. Right now, all I want you to remember is that this value represents uh, a very crude measure of the total variability in the data set. Sum of the squares total, what I've just referred to, sum of the squares total is a crude measure of overall variability of scores on the dependent variable. Sum of the squares total represents the deviation of individual scores, um, I should not say that right, represents the deviations of individuals scores represented by the symbol X. Uh, X, you'll recall, represents the scores that are displayed by individual participants. Some of the squares total represents the deviation of the scores of these individuals from the grand mean. This uh, total variability is then going to be divided into its two constituent parts between versus within, but pause before we go any further. Think of it this way. Imagine you did not do analysis of variance where you're comparing three treatment conditions. Imagine you've got 21 participants, but you're not paying any attention to what condition they're in. For these 21 participants, you've determined what their grand mean score is, and you computed the variance of scores for these 21 participants. That is the kind of variability that's represented by the sum of the squares total. Uh, it represents the deviation of individual participant scores from the grand mean, the overall mean based on all 21 participants in this case. Now, we are going to take that total variability and we're going to divide it into its two constituent parts between versus within. That brings us to the first row in the table, which represents between groups variability. Uh, under the head source, we have this heading between groups. Some of the squares between is 700 and something. Degrees freedom is 2. Mean square is 350. Uh, what are these numbers all about? We begin with the sum of the squares between groups. Sum of the squares between, in this case, is 700.57. We want to convert that crude measure of variability into a more refined measure of variability. We're going to convert it into the mean square between groups, in this case 350 and something. Definition for mean square between groups. Mean square between groups is an estimate of the variance of scores on the dependent variable based on the deviations of the treatment condition means represented by the symbol M with a K subscript from the grand mean. Let's say that again. Mean square between groups, symbol for that is MS with a BN subscript. It's an estimate of the variance of scores on the dependent variable based on the deviations of the treatment condition means from the grand mean. Now if you're like me, a verbal definition like that is kind of difficult to visualize and that's why with a lot of these concepts I give you a visual representation of them. And that's on the next slide. Now here is a set of fictitious outcomes. 
Uh, the only thing I've plotted on this graph is the grand mean based on all 21 participants and then the treatment condition means for our three treatment conditions. This is going to be a set of fictitious outcomes that is ultimately going to give us non-significant results. But nonetheless, I want to talk about this issue of between groups variability. First of all, M with a grand subscript that's our grand mean. That's the mean score on the dependent variable. You recall dependent variables exercise minutes. Uh, M with a grand subscript is our grand mean uh, on the dependent variable exercise minutes based on all 21 participants. If you took the average minutes of exercise displayed by all 21 participants, it would be 35.86. That's represented by our horizontal dashed line. What if we looked at the mean scores on the dependent variable for each of the treatment conditions? Well, the seven participants in the high incentive condition showed relatively high a mean score on exercise minutes. They had a treatment condition mean of 43.86 minutes represented by this dot. Notice that they deviate from the grand mean a little bit. They scored a little bit higher than the grand mean. People in the medium incentive condition scored just about at the grand mean. Uh, for the medium incentive condition, these seven people displayed a mean score of 33.29, but the seven people in the low incentive condition scored a little bit below the grand mean. They showed a mean score of 30.43. Notice each of these treatment conditions deviate from the grand mean a little bit. That's why we call it mean square between groups. It's an estimate of how much variability is there between the groups represented by this graph. Now, mean square between groups is important to you as the researcher. If you're the researcher, you hope that your independent variable has a big effect, so you hope that the treatment condition means deviate a lot from the grand mean. Larger the treatment effect, larger the mean square between. Remember that mean square between reflects signal in this signal to noise ratio. And therefore, the mean square between is going to serve as the numerator in the formula for computing F. Here I've got a red arrow pointing at the mean square between, reflecting the fact that it's going to be the signal in our signal to noise ratio. Mean square between is larger if the treatment effect is larger. Uh, here's two graphs that I think I showed at um, in a previous lecture, but now I'm attaching some numbers to them. Um, two fictitious outcomes in two parallel universes. Imagine in one universe you conducted this investigation, we'll call it study A. You're not very fortunate in this universe, you got a small treatment effect. Uh, this is the one where treatment condition mean is 35 point something. Notice the, uh, or rather the grand mean based on all 21 people is 35 point something. Notice the treatment condition means do not deviate from the grand mean very much. Uh, the high condition is just a little bit above the grand mean. Medium condition is just about on the grand mean. Low condition is just a smidgen below the grand mean. You've got a small treatment effect here. I actually did analysis variance on these results. Uh, the computer told me the mean square between was 350.29. That number by itself doesn't mean anything, but we're going to compare it to the analogous number from a parallel universe where you did better. Imagine in a parallel universe, different version of you did the same investigation, but you were fortunate. In this universe, you got a big treatment effect. Now notice now the grand mean is bigger. That doesn't matter much. What's important about this outcome is the fact that the treatment condition means now deviate a great deal from the grand mean. Uh, notice when you look at the seven people in the high incentive condition, they score substantially above the grand mean. Uh, people in the medium incentive condition score noticeably lower than the grand mean. People in the low incentive condition score even lower than the grand mean. Uh, these treatment condition means deviate a great deal from the grand mean. That gives us a big treatment effect. When I analyzed this fictitious data, a uh, computer told me that the mean square between was 3,208. Notice what a big number this is, 3,000 and something 
compared to the relatively small number I got with study A, my small treatment effect. Um, this is the way it goes. If your independent variable has a big effect, you'll get a big mean square between. It represents how much variability there is between treatment conditions. That's not the only source of variability in analysis of variance. When you do analysis of variance, there's also going to be within groups variability. It's represented by the second row in our ANOVA summary table. Second row ANOVA summary table under the heading source, it says within groups. Some of the squares within is 3,500 and something. Degrees freedom is 18. Mean square is 194. Uh, what are these numbers all about? First of all, some of the squares within groups, under the heading SS for some of the squares, uh, you begin with the sum of the squares within groups. This is a very crude measure of variability. You want to turn it into a more standardized measure of variability. So you're going to divide it by the degrees of freedom within. Convert it into mean square within groups. That is, ultimately, you want to convert it into this value. Under MS for mean square, you want to convert it into the mean square within. Once you've done that, your mean square within groups, which we'll represent as MS with a WN subscript, mean square within groups is an estimate of variance of scores on the dependent variable based on the deviations of individual scores from the mean of their condition. It's an estimate of variance of scores on the dependent variable based on the deviations of individual scores from the mean of their condition. Once again, individual people represented by the symbol X, the mean of a given treatment condition represented by M with a uh, K subscript. What would that look like visually? Here's one of our fictitious outcomes. This is a fictitious outcome where the treatment effect was relatively small. I show this just to refresh your memory on what within groups variability is all about. Think about it this way. Focus only on the seven people that are in the low incentive condition. The big black dot represents the mean score for the low incentive condition. Notice where this uh, location of this mean is. Notice the extent to which the seven people in this treatment condition deviate from the mean of their condition. The little open O symbols are mean are the um, raw scores displayed by individual people. Uh, this is a person that exercised like 47 minutes in a typical week. This is an individual person that exercised maybe 12 minutes in a week. Notice how much the people in this treatment condition deviate from the mean of their treatment condition. Now keep that amount of variability in the back of your mind. We move to the next condition. Here's the mean score for the medium incentive condition. Notice the extent to which these seven people are deviating from the mean of their condition. Keep that in the back of your mind. We move to the third treatment condition, the high incentive condition. Uh, here's the mean score for the high incentive condition. Notice the extent to which the seven people in this condition deviate from their mean. If you sort of took the average of those three sets of deviations, you would have the mean square within groups. It's not a straight up average, but it's the con concept. Um, what is the typical variability within one of the treatment conditions? That is what's represented by the mean square within groups. You've heard me say in a previous lecture, mean square within is not affected by the treatment effect. Mean square within reflects only error variance. It reflects only noise. We call it error variance because we don't know where it comes from. To go to the previous slide, uh, how come this person scored low? How come this person scored high? We don't know why, so we think of it as being merely error variance. Error variance we have not explained. Mean square within is not affected by the treatment effect. Mean square within reflects only error variance, only noise, and that's why it serves as the denominator in our formula for computing F. And yes, we are going to see our formula for computing F. We're actually going to compute obtained F statistic for the current analysis. Size of the mean square within is not affected by the size of the treatment effect. 
the mean square within, the actual numeric value that it takes, should be pretty much the same regardless of whether your independent variable had a big effect or a small effect. To illustrate this, I cooked up some data. Study A, we're going to see later on, study A is the data set that's going to give us non-significant results. Uh, study A, we have a small treatment effect. Notice the black dots don't deviate from the grand mean very much. That's your first tip that you're going to have non-significant results here. Uh, I did analysis of variance on this data set, and the computer told me that the mean square within was 194.44. Now remember that number. I then cooked up a different data set that I knew would give me significant results. Notice the mean for the treatment conditions are now substantially different from the grand mean. Uh, for the high incentive condition, this mean score is a lot higher than the grand mean. For the medium incentive condition, uh, treatment condition mean is a lot lower than the grand mean. You're going to get statistically significant results here. I have a big treatment effect, but look at this mean square within is exactly the same value as was before. In study B, mean square within is 194.44. In study A, the mean square within was 194.44. Uh, how much variability there is within a treatment condition should not be affected by the independent variable. So your mean square within should be pretty much the same value regardless of whether you get statistically significant results. End of part one of this video. Proceed to part two. This is a reminder to me to stop my video now and let it render. Uh, if you're uh, watching my video, you can close this video down and open up part two of the video. You don't need to open up a new document. The document you have in front of you uh, will contain the next bit of lecturing that I'm going to do.